So I'm the one to say thank you to all of you for being present for this occasion. Thank you, World Expedition. Thank, thank you, Sue, for your kind words. And thank you, Brad, and all the team for uh, bringing all this together. So I'm Jean-Claude. I'm talking from Chamonix, France. And I want to take you what I call a, a transition trip or a transition adventure towards what I call desirable future. I've been working all my life on adventure tourism. I'm so fortunate that I was able to, to enjoy the beauty of the whole world, deserts, mountains, sea, forests. Well, I'm so privileged to be able to enjoy all that, that and work on that. I've been all my life uh, guiding and taking people and having an adventure travel company. So I was, uh, I was very much fortunate to have the opportunity to, to benefit from all this and to develop along the years a certain, a certain view. So um, my point today with you is to have a reflection and a transition, which is a movement. You know, it's a, it's a dynamic movement as life is based on movement. So from what I call from growth to sufficiency. But before I start, I want to invite on stage now you know, I want to invite um, someone that's never been invited, but is usually always present in any kind of gathering, presentation, meetings, expedition, or whatever. It's, of course, planet Earth. This picture is not any picture. This picture is for photography what Mona Lisa is for painting. It's the more famous, the most reproduced, the most printed picture ever taken. And it's been taken by space mission Apollo 17 in December 1972. And it was so famous that it got a name called Blue Marble. And the, well, of course, uh, when it was taken, it was the first time we had a vision of this, of planet Earth like this. And <clears throat> think with me, try, try to figure out a few words that come to your mind when you see that. The first thing is that it is round. Well, of course it's round. We all know it's round. We know that from Copernicus and Galileo, but it's the first time we have the visual experience of how round the planet Earth is. And we love and work with tourism. So experience is a key word for us. So we experience how round this planet Earth. And you see it's upside down. It was kind of interesting to see that on this most famous picture of planet Earth, the South Pole is on top. The second word that comes to me is that it's blue. Well, uh, I would say kind of blue, big, many shades of blue, right? But um, Mars is called the red planet. The moon is kind of gray and uh, well, planet Earth is blue. It's the only one that is blue that we know about. The other thing that uh, we think of is that it's it's beautiful, you know, and it's kind of um, it's kind of home, right? It has a feeling of it's very familiar. Everybody can imagine him, themselves on, on a spot on the planet where we stay, you know, looking at it from from the space. So it's round, it's blue, it's beautiful. But you know what? I have some news for you. It is small. This is also the vision we have. It is small. You know what is 12,442? This figure is the diameter of planet Earth. I call this the 12,742 syndrome. We have the consciousness that it's only 12,000 kilometers uh, diameter. It's very, very small on the cosmos scale. We, know, we now know that there are some planets that are billions of light years distant from us. And the light year is the distance that the light makes in one year at the speed of 300,000 kilometers per second, every second. And it's billions of light years away. So when you understand that, when you have this understanding, well, really 12,042 is very, very small. So it's round, it's blue, it's beautiful, but essentially it is small. Well, eventually on this wonderful planet, life happened. And to what is our concern? Uh, well, this is the only planet where, where that we know of that life happened. I, I hope, I believe, I, 
I do hope that life happened also, any form of life in other planets, but we still don't know about it. But <clears throat> it happened in the form of this guy, you know, this small creature sprawling on its four feet and eventually uh, stood up, uh, eventually moved and transformed evolution to, to, to sapiens. Who is sapiens? Who is sapiens? Sapiens is you, sapiens is me. Sapiens is everyone you ever met and everyone you will ever meet in your whole life is sapiens. And you know what? Sapiens only happened 300,000 years ago, which is nothing compared to the scale of only planet Earth, which is 4.3 billion years old. So we just arrived, okay? The way we are, the way we physically are, genetically are, we have just landed on blue marble. And during 300,000 years, we've been doing, well, we've been doing this, you know, we've been like in Australia, uh, um, hunting and uh, gathering and basically, basically living in small tribes. Well, but basically what we did is surviving. This is what we've been doing for 300,000 years is surviving. But, <clears throat> you know, uh, Sapiens is, is a very special guy. He's very curious. <laughs> He's very, very curious. He tries, he tries again, he fails, he fails again, he tries, he fails, he fails better. You know, failing better, always failing better, eventually succeeds. And this Sapiens eventually moved to this Sapiens, you know, so able to start agriculture, able to make uh, a carriage that would take some uh, potatoes from Sydney to, to a nearby uh, area, eventually building a, a ship that was able to cross the oceans. I mean, it's incredible. It's a lot of technology to create a ship like this or to create some windmills, you know, to make some energy and to create some villages with fortifications, with, uh, with uh, hard rocks, you know, like uh, to, to protect from um, invaders. Well, it took 3,000 300,000 years to reach this. From this stage of Homo sapiens to this stage of Homo sapiens, it took 300,000 years. But this is nothing compared to what was bound to happen. It happened what we call the Industrial Revolution. We were technologically advanced enough to have machines do the jobs in our place. First steam, then engine power, then nuclear power, then anything power, we have now machines doing the job for us. And this happened 200 years ago. 200 years ago, the industrial revolution permitted that we had machines doing the job for us. And this courage that I was talking about transformed into this courage. Much faster, much bigger, much more good. This machine that was very helpful to make some agriculture transform into this machine. Much more power, much more work, much more efficient, bigger, faster, stronger. This ship only wins in aesthetic compared with this ship. But if the objective is to bring goods over the oceans from Australia to China, well, this tanker is much more efficient than the wind power old uh, boat. We transform this windmill for energy. Well, we found a new way to make energy, much more energy, much faster, much more bigger, stronger, faster. And this small village that is cute and nice transform into this village. I'm always amazed about how humans are creative and strong and intelligent and clever to be able to create and to organize society so that we could live together in such places, you know, in such villages. Imagine the quantity of people living there, the energy required, the water required, food required, transportation required, information required, so that we can live together in this village. This is really the change that the industrial revolution brought. And this guy, Homo sapiens, evolved to a new 
a new kind of homo sapiens, which are called homo economicus. But homo economicus, you know, depicted as a man, uh, always with a smartphone, a suitcase, and he's addicted to growth. His action is work. He's fond of money and his pref hobby is consuming. This is me, this is you, this is all of us. Of course, different from places on the other, uh, on planet Earth, of course, but basically Homo economicus is ruling the world today. And this has a word, you know, we have a word for this, uh, the, 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 the idea that uh, humans put their feet everywhere on the planet. There is no longer white space on the world map. Everywhere we have humankind that put his feet. And this has a name, it's called the Anthropocene. In Greek, Anthropos means human. Anthropocene is the era where the most important factor of change of, on the planet Earth is mankind. Please, please remember this, this word Anthropocene. The most impactful thing on planet Earth is mankind. It used to be earthquakes. It used to be volcanoes. It used to be natural phenomena. Now it's mankind that is shaping the world. And there are two consequences on Anthropocene, one good and one bad consequence. So the good consequence is that thanks to economic growth technology that we developed over the last 200 years, we have an unprecedented improvement in the human living conditions on Earth. You know what we would all be doing two, 300 years from now? We all, I, I would be in the field growing potato because I'm in Chamonix. You would be back home after a day in the fields growing potato. This is what our great grandfather were all doing. And this over the last 300,000 years before. You know what was life expectancy 300 years ago? It was 40 years, 40 years, you were more likely to be dead. You know what was child mortality 300 years ago? It was 50%. One on every two child would die before they reach one year old. If you have appendicitis, you're dead. If you have a strong tooth infection, you're dead. You know, thanks to Anthropocene, thanks to technology, thanks to energy, thanks to development, we were able to improve so much the conditions. So I'm not the kind to say that uh, we, we didn't do it the, the right way. No, I think we improved the conditions so much and we cannot idealize a world before that. But there is a bad news. And the bad news is that there are limits to planet Earth. You remember I said uh, blue marble is um, 12,742 kilometers wide? Well, it's a limited area. So this is, this is the curves you can see on anything on Earth, uh, especially uh, since the uh, Industrial Revolution. You see population, you see GDP, you see foreign investment, you see energy use, water use, paper production, tourism, transportation, fertilizers. If you take any curve, it starts flat, 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 and then suddenly it goes rocketing skywards. And in mathematics, this has a name, it's called exponentiality. This is the selfie of Anthropocene. The selfie of Anthropocene is exponentiality. So I want to look at this with you through three main curves. The first curve is GDP, world GDP. Well, you see world GDP, it's flat, 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 and it's been flat for 300,000 years. And suddenly in 1950, it goes rocketing skyward. 1950 is the date where all curves go up. Scientists call that the great acceleration. GDP was flat over all these years and now it's rocketing skyward. And all governments are elected with the promise of a 3% GDP growth. 3% GDP growth, well, this is the minimum you want, right? 3% is when tax get in, when the pension funds function, when social security works, well, uh, the, the, the whole system works based on 3%. If it's more than 3%, it means more growth, more money, more everything, but on 3%, we make it. 
it's important to understand that 3% per year means doubling in 27 years. So imagine today, we are on 2023. Imagine that in 2050, 27 years from now, the world doubles. Imagine that in 2050, in 2077, after 27 years, it doubles again. So this is what we have, everlasting growth. What is growing forever in nature? I don't grow forever. I was a very cute little baby, <laughs> very nice. I grew a man, and now I know that I uh, stopped growing and I will start somehow kind of decline. Same thing for plants, same thing for animals. In, in, in the world, in, on blue marble, everything starts, grows, and dies. For some reason, we created an economic system where economic growth is endless, infinite growth. This is a big question. A second curve, this is the size of the world population. You know, It took 300,000 years of a flat, 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 flat curve. And do you know where we reached the first billion? Where we reached the first billion in 1805. It took 300,000 years to reach 1 billion humans on Earth. It took 217 years to reach 8 billion. This is exponentiality. This is the selfie of Anthropocene. And there is a very important figure also to understand is energy. There is a total correlation between energy and GDP. So when you see the curve of energy, it's flat, 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 flat forever, based on traditional biomass, which is basically wood. Wood was the only energy we had to cook and to heat ourselves. And then with the Industrial Revolution, we started with coal, then oil, then gas, and more recently with hydropower, wind power, solar power, and other renewables power. But still today, 82% of our energy matrix, global energy matrix, is coal, oil, and gas, 82%. And these three sources of energy are called fossil energy. So our world is based on fossil energy. This is what powers all machines that make all our GDP. No energy, no machine, no machine, no GDP. So our growth is based on fossil fuels. And now we know that the consumption of fossil fuels adds some problem that will come to talk just later. But remember that. This is the selfie on Anthropocene. We are based on infinite growth in GDP, in population, and we are totally addicted to energy, especially fossil fuel energy. This is exponentiality the selfie of Anthropocene. And the question, of course, you will ask now, if you follow what I'm saying, is that, is exponential growth sustainable? How far can we go? Is it possible to keep growing forever? Well, this question is not new. In 1972, the same year when we had the blue marble picture, there was a, the MIT uh, was asked by a think tank called the Club de Rome, um, European-based um, think tank. It was not called think tank at that time, but this is what it is basically. And they asked uh, to uh, MIT, a group of, uh, of uh, scientists, to think about the limits to growth. Um, so this is what they did. This group of um, scientists led by Donella Meadows, in 1972, the lead scientist of this fundamental piece of research is a woman. I think it's worth mentioning. And this report eventually got the name of Meadows Report. So they studied the limits to growth. They were the first to make a modelization of blue marble. They took variables. They had the computer that was the size of a football field with um, uh, some cards with holes, much less powerful than your smartphone and any smartphone today and they make modelization. They studied limits to growth. And their work had very big impact. 
It sold 12 million copies. It was translated in 37 languages and presented in all places of power. The White House, the United Nations, the European Union, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And they did the first modernization of System Earth. And this is what they did. Their computer called World 3 showed that if we keep the pace of growth that we experience, and remember, this was the years after World War II, so it was a world more of 5 to 10% to year GDP growth. Um, well, the simulation they did that in the decade 2020 to 2030, there will pollution and resource scarcity will start to impact industrial production, food, and population. You know, they have these five inputs, you know, resources, industry, population, food, and pollution. And they just make all simulation and decide, well, this is not sustainable. This was the conclusion of their report. They didn't use the word sustainable at the time, but in the nine scenario they did, only one said it could, it could work. And now we call this sustainability. So if, if I want to define simply sustainability, I would define it this way. You have the economy, you have social issues, and you have environmental issues. Sustainability would be at the heart of these three, you know, what I call harmonizing social, environmental, and economic needs of modern world. This would be sustainability. Well, what happened, and this is history now, the year after the Meadows report was the first oil shark in 1973, and then in 1979, the second oil shark, and this recommendation were not followed, obviously. Um, last year, it was the 50 years of the Meadows report, and um, Dennis Meadows, who was uh, the, the, the secretary of the report, said that, well, sustainable is maybe no longer an option. Now it's important we had to transition. So this is what Dennis Meadows said. So sustainability, <clears throat> well, we didn't choose this path, obviously. So there are two major issues that I want to talk with you. It's about, before I go to what I can say solutions, is um, the issues of climate and biodiversity. These are very important issues. When we talk about climate, what are we talking about? Basically, and I want to make it very simple, we're talking about greenhouse effect. Greenhouse effect is a natural phenomenon. It's natural, it's good, it's essential. The atmosphere protects the earth from overheating. So, this, so the heat that comes from the sun, some of it is trapped inside the atmosphere. Most escapes, that makes that the, the temperature on planet Earth is stable. And it is stable at 15 degrees. Thanks to greenhouse effect, the average temperature on planet Earth is 15 degrees. And this is thanks to the atmosphere and to the greenhouse effect it provokes. If you compare it with other planets, in Mars, there is a very thin atmosphere. So it means that there is no greenhouse effect. So it means that temperature average is minus 50 degrees Celsius. So the miracle, what I call the miracle, which is life, you know, the miracle doesn't happen on planet Mars, the way it happened on planet Earth, because average temperature is minus 50 because there is no greenhouse effect. If you take the opposite on Venus, there's a very thick atmosphere, there is a very strong greenhouse effect, and the average temperature is 420, 420 degrees Celsius. No miracle. On planet Mars, no miracle. On Venus, no miracle. On planet Earth, plus 15 degrees, no miracle happens life, because we have the correct amount of greenhouse effect working for us. What happens is that as we emit more CO2, especially by burning fossil fuels, due to our activity, our economic needs, and our system based on growth, we, we increase the greenhouse effect phenomenon, and we increase average temperature on planet Earth. So we're talking about a concentration of CO2 in the atmosphere 
That was for a million years, between 200 parts per million ppm, 200 to 300 ppm over a million years, and over 200 last years, each rocketed to more than 400 ppm. This is another selfie of Anthropocene. This is another exponential curve, right? So we increased the quantity of CO2 in the atmosphere that makes that greenhouse effect works more. So I want to, to give you an idea of temperature. On the left side of your screen, you're seeing the world 22,000 years ago. I mean, the world of Europe. Europe 22,000 years ago. At this time, there was three kilometers thick of ice on northern Europe. Uh, you would go from Paris to London by foot. I, I mean, um, a piece of ice that would eventually become <laughs> Paris and London, okay? <laughs> the climate was very dry, very cold, and the oceans were 100 meters, 120 meters lower than they are today. And the right side of the screen is the Europe the way we know it now. Do you know what is the difference in temperature in average temperature between the left map and the right map. Try to guess. The difference of temperature average between the left map and the right map. It's five degrees. Only five degrees plus makes this difference in the world. So when people say, well, you know, one degree, two degrees, three degrees more, this is not a problem. Of course, in daily life, for meteorology, for the weather forecast, one, two, three, four degrees is not, not a big deal. But if we're talking about climate, one, two, three, four, five degrees difference average on planet Earth makes a big difference. So the world used to be like this, plus five degrees, it became like this, the way we know it. So it means that plus five degrees, it becomes like this. The whole world becomes the Tenere Desert, which is not exactly what we can think of a desirable future for mankind. Maybe it's okay for some insects, you know, that are adaptation to live in deserts of 50 degree plus, but not, not good for humankind. So <clears throat> this is the consequence of Anthropocene on climate that we have to take into consideration. And this is why we need to transit to a different world. There is another big issue, which is biodiversity. You know, the Secretary Nation, so General Secretary of the United Nations, Antonio Gutierrez, um, said that biodiversity is under attack. Well, we have 1 million species endangered. We had vertebrates, invertebrates, mammals, fishes down 69%. The main reason is that the habitat is vanishing. Some basic functions of life on planet Earth, like photosynthesis and pollinization are threatened. Uh, Amazon can no longer be a carbon sink if we keep on deforestation. So I mean, biodiversity, which has some uh, natural biologic rules of our world are under attack because of, because of our success. You know, we are victim of our success. We've been so good in implementing technology, improvement, growth, um, uh, new, new systems, um, new myths, new narratives to make our world better that now we, we feel the power of um, planetary boundaries. And this is a real study, you know. So you see the scientists have divided the world in nine boundaries. I will go quick because it's a bit technical. One of them is climate, one of them is biodiversity, but there are seven others. And you see in red that we already crossed six of the seven planetary boundaries. Well, to sum it up, you know, we have reached some of the planetary boundaries. The uh, world based on growth is at stake. And Homo economicus says, well, <laughs> Go back, guys, <laughs> it's a trap. <laughs> I'll try to make it funny because um, this reality is very important to integrate. And I think it's an opportunity for new change and new narrative. But the first thing to do is to take into consciousness that infinite growth in a finite world is not sustainable. And 
if you want to sum it up quickly, well, due to both excess of energy consumption and planetary boundaries, the narrative of exponential growth is over. We just have to take this into account and we need a new narrative. So what are our options? You know, one option is, uh, well, this is one option. This option is a denial, you know. No, no, forget, we don't have this problem. Well, I can see less and less people now are on denial. Some people still are, they just refuse to see this physical reality. In my opinion, this is not an option. There's another option is uh, to believe in the technological miracle. Well, <clears throat> well, of course, technology is very important part of the solution, but I'm afraid that uh, technology would be considered the solution. I'm not sure I want to leave the, the, the future of my kids and my grandchildren in the hands of people like Elon Musk, you know? I don't really trust this guy, you know? I'm not sure what his real goals are. I don't think it's okay to live in the hands of few people, the, the, the face that their technology will eventually save the world. It takes a long time to develop technology. Of course, it's important technology, but what technology do we want? This should be a democratic discussion. So believing in the solution through just waiting for the mir technological miracle to happen in my opinion, is not an option. Believing in sustainability, well, you know, this is sustainability at its core uh, concept. But the reality of sustainability we face is this one, you know, the big economy, a bit of social, a bit on environmental. So um, I would say this is not a solution. So <clears throat> what is our solution, you know, if this is no longer option? What are our options? Of course, after this presentation telling you that the narrative of infinite growth is over, now you want me to tell you the solution. Well, I don't have the miracle solution. If I had, everybody would have, and we won't have this kind of webinar. So we have to think of new narrative. And one option I think is a transition from growth to what I call uh, sufficiency. So what is the narrative of sufficiency? I like to show it in this kind of graphic. So of course we have the economy. The economy, GDP, uh, consuming, markets, food, agriculture, housing, clothes, all this of course is fundamental, is essential to living. But to understand in this narrative that economy is not the most important thing in life, no longer homo economicus, no. We have, economy is only a part of human diversity of all kinds of society that we can develop. Economy is an important part, but it's only a part of that. And human diversity in society is only a part of the whole nature and the great tribe of all living creatures. So when you, this is simple to understand and really makes sense. It's a matter of positioning, you know, to understand that economy is only a part of humanity, which is only a part of nature. We are not above nature. Economy is not above human. No, it's the contrary. Economy is part of human diversity and society, which is part of nature and belief. So how do we transit towards sufficiency? The first thing is what I call engagement. And I like the engagement of this young lady. I don't really agree with all she says, but in terms of engagement, we can say that she really makes a difference. So my advice to you, if you want to go towards transition, is to engage. The way you want, in your church, in your football club, in your company, in your family, anywhere you want, just engage. This is a way to go towards transition. The second thing is your personal contribution. And I wanted to show you, this, this is French figure, but I would say maybe it's not that different from a uh, all I would say developed countries uh, like Australia or European Union, the States and also, but see, where is our carbon footprint? You know, basically is three things. First is private car. Private car is our bigger our footprint. If you want to make a, a change, if you want to change narrative, well, use less your private car. And you have many options, public transportation, bike or e-bike, go buy food, um, Share car sharing, 
uh, carpooling, you know, there are many options to use less your car. Eat less meat would be important. There is 14 meals a week, seven lunch, seven dinner. Well, everyone knows how many of them are, um, are made with meat. So decide to lower. I'm not here to tell you to stop eating meat. Of course, this is not my point. I eat meat, but just from 14 to 10, 10 to eight, eight to six, you decide the quantity that suits you. And the third thing would be heating and cooling your houses. If you make efforts on these three, well, you engage in kind of transition. And of course, we have to change more than personal contribution, which is limited. We have to change what I call the transition narrative. So <clears throat> we are talking today on World Tourism Day. So what would be a new narrative for tourism? And we know that tourism, uh, which is based on mobility, of course, uh, is a major carbon footprint in the world. And because of that, is facing what I call an existential crisis. So we need a new narrative for tourism. So what would be a new narrative for tourism? I call it this way. I call it from more better. How can you trace it from more tourism to better tourism? I want to show you a few pictures that we can really say that this is not the best tourism we can think of. This picture, you know, when you see this boat entering this marble beauty of Venice, you know, you think this is not maybe the best way we can do tourism. The carbon footprint is enormous. The siege of a, a, a town by five, 6,000 people entering the city for one day visit only. Uh, all you can eat buffets and especially lots of uh, disco lounges. Uh, I mean, conception at, at the core of this uh, business model. Well, I think we can do better than that, can't we? Especially in adventure travel, we definitely do better than that. When you look at this Mona Lisa, you know, this, of course, if you go to Paris, you want to see Mona Lisa and have the dream, and that, that's natural, that's okay. It's a great piece of art, of course. But this is what you expect, but this is what you get. If you want to see Mona Lisa, you have to make a lot of fight with your elbows so that you can take a picture of people taking picture of Mona Lisa. Mona Lisa has been elected the worst tourism experience in the world. Can't we do better than that? When we talk about adventure travel, of course, you see Mount Everest, a familiar picture of Mount Everest. I'm a climber, I'm a mountaineering, so I really love it. But when I saw that picture, I had one of the shock of my life. This picture is Hillary Step, you know, uh, 8,600 um, 8, meters high. And there is a traffic jam on Mount Everest on the few two or three days a year when it's possible to summit. So this is not the dream of adventure of any mountain climber, you know. Then we see that something got wrong in the way we do. So we have to find out a transition narrative for tourism. I think a transition would be a decarbonized tourism, a local tourism, and an educational tourism low carbon as much as possible, privilege local and extra local destination and privilege what I call educational tourism, a tourism where you learn. Maybe the most important thing you do when you travel is to learn something. So if you put at the heart of your tourism choice or operation, the idea of education, I think we change and we gradually change the way we do tourism. Um, this implies a kind of transition marketing, you know, and what I say that guests don't know, those people who are professional, usually guests don't know what they want in tourism. We professional in tourism, we spend our time telling people what, what, what would be good for them. So we don't have to sell what guests want. We have to sell what destinations need. This is a new way to find and to understand the way tourism works. This is a new narrative for tourism operators. No. And what do destinations need? Well, they need guests who care. You know, guests who are really engaged and, and want to learn something in the destination. A guest who care is a guest who wants to learn. 
So guests who want to learn are the people that are part of this transition narrative. When we talk about adventure travel, um, well, we need also a transition narrative. And the idea behind that is that you still can have a big adventure and a small footprint. You know, It's possible to do that. So of course, you will fly to go to destination. But when you are destination, maybe you don't fly. So you don't travel to the US, you travel to California. You don't travel to Brazil, you travel to Bahia. This is to make choices within big destinations. Where there are big countries like that, when you're in a place, you choose a small part of it and you have a smaller footprint and you know what? You spend more time and you learn more. In the end, you have a better experience. So this is yesterday adventure travel and transition adventure travel. Well, it used to be global, it's better to be local or what I say, extra local. There were no carbon concerns. Now we need to make adventure travel with low carbon impact. It used to be short and fast. You know, uh, one week in Patagonia, uh, 10 days in Nepal. It doesn't make sense. You know, it's better to have long, to maybe to travel less, but when you travel, you travel longer and you have much more free time, you, you go slow. Slow is a good, is a good word to define tomorrow's travel. It used to be Instagrammable. You know, if you have on Instagram, you're done. You know, you share your picture with everyone, you're someone. No, no, Instagrammable is a poor definition of tourism. We can do better. Educational tourism is much better than Instagrammable tourism. So we change to sum up from growth to sufficiency. What I like to express also this uh, transition uh, adventure travel is if it's slow, if it's low carbon, and if it's local, well, it has a name that I call us local. So a transition narrative for adventure travel is a slow call tourism. So how do you choose a slow call tour operator? What is a slow call tour operator? Well, it's an operator that is focused on local and extra local destinations with the low carbon transport, especially within the visited destination. So this is an important step. Of course, there is a concern with little waste, no single use plastic. There is a very big sensibilization of guests, especially they want to learn. And the key part, the key part is to work with experienced and engaged guides. I think guides are a key part of transmitting this transition message to the guests. It's very important to work and to engage uh, guides that have this knowledge and have this kind of engagement. So um, <clears throat> this would be a local tour operator. You know? And um, this has been expressed a very nice way. And I was really happy to read this uh, by World Expedition. Um, they have developed over the years a concept which is, I would say, basically the same as local or educational tourism, which is thoughtful travel. And World Expedition is very good at that. You know, uh, they advocate for active travel. You know, you you are an actor on your expedition. You you are part of it. You're not simply an an a spectator of your expedition or your adventure. You're an actor of it. You know, and it's important to have positive impact. It's important to foster cultural tolerance. There is a strong concern with First Nation people. You know, sometimes I don't really like the idea of visiting uh, some people, you know, indigenous tribes, you know. I don't feel I belong to these places as a white 50 plus male European, you know. When I go to these places, sometimes I feel, wow, am I at the right place? Am I supposed to be here? But if you work with people, we have developed some kind of partnership, mutual benefit partnership, and to promote educational and cultural heritage, then it makes a difference. You know, it's very important to respect vulnerable animals. And again, and this is for me key, um, to engage with experienced guides, you know, and who knows uh, the basics of sustainability, who knows the key aspects of the destination, who know how to make the greater experience for you as a traveler. This is a, this is a great profession. You know? uh, if some of you young people are trying to think what they will do in life, you know, if you want to decide to be an adventure travel guide, you will choose an incredible profession, I can tell you. 
So <clears throat> to sum up, because we're almost in time, I mean, we are two minutes away from time. Uh, I wanted to, to make a conclusion speech, you know, and to say that considering the planetary boundaries, considering that blue marble is round, blue, beautiful, but very small, we need to make a shift, what I call a triple shift, a shift in lucidity, lucidity to understand and accept that there are planetary boundaries, a shift in humility to put mankind at its place in the great tribe of living, not above it, and a shift in responsibility to take action, to engage, and to create a new narrative because we are the one to decide our desirable future. If you want a better world, if you want a better tourism, if you want a better adventure travel, and if you want good opportunities for the, for the coming decades, for us, for our kids, for our grandchildren, if you want that, it's for us to make the decisions because the decades coming are key to changes that will happen. And this transition will happen anyway. So be better, we decide what we believe is a desirable future. I thank you for your attention. Thank you, World Expedition. Thank you, all of you, to be here. I hope you enjoyed, and I'm uh, happy to answer questions if there are some. Thank you very much for everybody.